Hello, everybody, and we are back for another interesting talk uh, during In the Bat Cave. The topics are getting better and better, and uh, I'm really pleased um, to welcome our next speaker, uh, Aditya. Who do we have yes. coming in to? Today, now we have Ilka from uh, Sonotype, and he's a global director there, and he's going to demystify what DevSecOps is to you and how it is important in a world where cyber attacks are ever increasing and what is DevSecOps, how do we, well, he will have a better idea and explain it to you. Hi, Elgo. Uh, Great to have you. Hey, happy to be here. Pleasure, pleasure. So right. how's it going on your end? You're in the UK, I've seen, huh? That's, that's exactly it. I'm, I'm in sunny London, where uh, long it may last, but I'm uh, very optimistically to uh, fit in uh, with the theme. Or my t-shirt, kind of thinking that I would be in a warmer place, but I think we can now uh, pull this off this way too. All right, let's uh, tell us quickly a, a little bit about yourself and then um, about the topic you're going to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Ilka Turun and I'm the Global Director of Pre-Sales Engineering here at Sonotype which is a lot of ways of saying uh, iCustomers and I make sure that uh, whatever uh, whatever um, we're putting into place in their software development environment works uh, as is intended and does what it says on the tin. So uh, my talk here today is really kind of a synthesis between uh, between my personal experience about how, what sort of behaviors do teams that implement DevSecOps uh, exhibit, what actually is those behaviors, but it's also a collection of a couple of pieces of research my employer uh, publishes every single year called the State of the Software Supply Chain, uh, which kind of brings in the science uh, of this talk. So I hope by the end of this all, uh, everybody listening here will uh, walk away with a little bit of an understanding uh, situations are actually developers encountering in terms of cybersecurity and what they are um, uh, what they're doing in order to mitigate that. You know, what are the kind of activities? Not everything is as intuitive as it seems, and a lot of it is, is, is much more simpler than you think. So hopefully, uh, by the end of it, you uh, will be uh, well and truly educated. Fantastic. So please, take the stage. All right. Show, show us what you got. <laughs> All right. Brilliant. Well, uh, man, no better introduction than that. So uh, I actually had a slide to have that exact discussion uh, uh, myself. So. You know, I've been at this for the last uh, half a decade or so, uh, and, and during this time, what I've witnessed really is this kind of renaissance uh, of uh, software development. Right? You know, we've seen organizations move from uh, move from just software craftsmanship into really thinking about it as an engineering process and kind of moving it uh, along in terms of uh, in terms of their works. So. Um, so um, uh, one of the things uh, that I've been uh, very privileged to be able to contribute some of my thoughts into uh, over these past years has been this uh, state of the software supply chain uh, recent uh, report that kind of brings out some of these uh, some of these experiences that we're feeling straight into the marketplace. Um, kind of uh, to start off with this, uh, start off with this, and you know, just have, having a discussion of what actually DevSecOps is. Uh, that I have to kind of uh, let everybody know in order to uh, in order to get us uh, closer uh, closer to the um, line of thinking. So um, and, and there's something called the software supply chain. The software supply chain is a thing that everybody who writes software has, but not a lot of people actually really think about it in, in, in that sort of term. So the software supply chain really is the chain of uh, things that you're pulling in or using in order to write the piece of software that you actually produce in your bills that you package in your containers to your customers, right? It's very similar to other types of manufacturing. If you think about it, manufacturing a car, for example, Right? Uh, no company does every single part uh, of that car themselves. There are specialist manufacturers, for example, producing brake pads. Uh, those brake pads get put into uh, warehouses or suppliers that then sell it off to the organizations that actually manufacture the cars and provide you, uh, provide you with the tools you need to assemble the final finished good. Similarly, in our, um, in our software engineering environment, what we're trying to achieve, developing software using as much uh, manufactured parts as we can and this actual chain happens uh, happens in our world as well in, in our world it's the uh, software dependencies that you're pulling in into your package JSON it's the containers that you're pulling in to support the building of your software and it is uh, it is the first those from the, the, the 
large websites, the GitHub's of this world, the NPM JSS. So all of this forms a full chain. And actually, this chain is a very meaningful analogy when we're starting to look at how can we uh, how can we secure uh, the final finished good, right? It's a, it's a very useful analogy to be thinking about. So uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about um, uh, DevOps itself. Right? DevOps, it, you know, at this point is about ten year old term. You know, it's kind of came to popularity uh, in the early 2010s. It's a synthesis of uh, development plus operations uh, and uh, bringing those two uh, parts in, uh, into their uh, into their um, uh, better ways. So what that has done is it's demonstrated uh, time and time again that uh, speeding up your software development process, just the mere act of uh, from keyboard to production, speeding that cycle up can be better for the enterprises. You know, we've had several pieces of uh, uh, seminal research that help us do this. For example, Dr. Nicole Forsgren has been one of these influential uh, characters who's published, for example, uh, her 2018 book, Accelerate, that very specifically describes what kind of benefits we can see. So Dr. Forsberg has, uh, Forsgren has also been uh, very, very influential in uh, championing the uh, State of DevOps report that I think it's on its eighth year uh, by this point. And one of the kind of tangible benefits that we see from uh, the uh, State of DevOps surveys is that organizations that are kind of classed elite, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of their performance, uh, should exhibit a couple of interesting signs. First and foremost, uh, they're much more uh, frequent to be into production. You know, in, in fact, when we compare them to the lower end uh, of organizations, we see that they deploy almost two hundred times more. They're typically a hundred times faster. Uh, from commit to deploy uh, compared to the laggard group or the group that doesn't uh, doesn't uh, operate as fast, and uh, they're almost almost two thousand five hundred times faster uh, in recovering in incidents. What's also interesting is that speed from uh, commit to deploy allows them to have about a seven times lower change in their failure rates, so or chance of uh, failure rates. So what that really means is that uh, uh, kind of incidentally what DevOps has kind of surfaced for us is um, time to market and time to deploy is also uh, pretty much related to our ability to recover from incidents to be able to uh, able to create software of higher quality that has less incidents and when incidents do occur uh, they they build in methodologies that help them recover from those incidents uh, on the spot. Why is this important? Uh, and how does security fit into this uh, picture? Well, uh, the number one thing to understand is that if we didn't have adversaries, we wouldn't need any security, right? The only reason for security is because there's a very real, see, very real scenario where uh, software that's being deployed uh, across the world is being exploited. In fact, cybercrime is the fastest growing uh, segment of crime. If you think about it, right, which uh, type of crime or or uh, mobbing or things like that, uh, or cybercrime, where we can install, uh, steal uh, data, sell that for a profit. We can install crypto miners, sell that for a profit, uh, and we can scale that infinitely, right? You know, we don't just have the, the region where we're at operating in, we have the entire world uh, and the internet as our playground. That's the reason why security has become such a big thing and why over these past few years, DevSecOps, uh, introducing security into this DevOps, uh, DevOps lifecycle has become such a big thing. The thing about, uh, and the thing about doing DevOps is not just us uh, as developers who are doing DevOps, right? It's not just us running sprints, you know, having uh, sprint plannings, having release times, having deadlines set upon us. It's also the adversaries that are doing the exact same thing. And uh, just like for us, speed, time to market uh, is beneficial. So too is it for our adversaries uh, as well. This is probably well exemplified by looking at a couple of scenarios of how uh, some cyber cyber attack campaigns have played out uh, in the past. Um, my world very much is in the Java world, so uh, one of the first things that I wanted to, to talk to you about is uh, an adversarial tactic that uh, has been kind of out there for uh, years and years and years. It's called Wayne and Craig. Essentially, uh, this case study uh, takes us back to the uh, year 2017. In 2017, 
uh, there was a big uh, series of the security breaches, uh, probably the most famous one of those uh, being uh, a, a company called Equifax in North America, which caused about 300 million uh, pieces of personally identifiable data to be leaked. What's interesting though is if we look at the background of that situation, that security, uh, security attack actually was caused by uh, a piece of open source they were using to run their websites. It's actually something, a well-known framework, one of the best frameworks uh, uh, in the Java business called Apache Struts. In 2007, uh, on the March 7th uh, of, of 2017, they published a new security vulnerability uh, on Apache Struts, uh, which was a remote code execution flaw. What that means is any adversary uh, is able to, with relatively low skill, take about uh, 20 lines of code, send that code to any website running that version of Apache Struts and essentially run their own code on that server. So not the code on the website, their own code on the server that was running the website. Now, what's pretty interesting is that Apache is a great example of a project that does the right thing. They found out about it, they did an immediate fix, they did a huge publicity campaign uh, to the world uh, about that security vulnerability. Well, one day after that security vulnerability was released, um, uh, the NSA, the uh, National Security Agency in the US, actually uh, later revealed that they would already started seeing their Pentagon servers being scanned against or being uh, opportunistically targeted for potential uh, implementations of this, of this security vulnerability. The very next day, Cisco, one of the world's largest networking gear uh, manufacturers, reports that they observed a very high number of these exploitation events occurring, uh, occurring um, uh, uh, across the world. By March the 10th, so uh, three days after, three, four different companies uh, have, have since reported that they actually got compromised because of this vulnerability. This included Equifax, but it also included things like the uh, uh, Internal Revenue Agency of Canada, the taxman of, of, of Canada. Uh, we also saw it in the Statistics Bureau over there. You know, we saw it in a payment gateway uh, over in Japan. And from there, uh, a couple of days afterwards, Okinawa Power uh, and Japan Post both uh, reported that they got compromised by the exact same attack. We saw similar situations uh, occurring uh, a month later uh, over in India. Now, the thing about the story, you know, we can see this attack kind of trickling through the timeline. Uh, you know, since then, we've seen this exact same security vulnerability being used to, for example, run a crypto mining campaign. You know, instead of running your own code, what you do is you use this vulnerability to install a crypto miner on the server and you get whatever cryptocurrency uh, kind of comes out of it. Uh, we saw India's Alcar system uh, a year later being exploited by the exact same uh, situation. And uh, as custodians of Maven Central, which is one of the largest uh, copies of uh, open source on the internet, where most organizations download the Java open source, we, we've actually observed that to this day, uh, almost 65% of Fortune 100 companies are still downloading these vulnerable versions of Apache Stots. What's also significant about this attack, though, is that it only really took three days from the vulnerability being published and a fix for that vulnerability being published to it actively being exploited and companies actually getting hacked, um, hacked by uh, this issue. Now, in all of these cases, this wasn't the thing that led to the exfiltration of data, but this was the window that let the um, uh, attackers enter these organizations to find other exploits, to find other software uh, to, uh, to uh, manage. So it's a very, very influential piece uh, of code that you're running when you're running it, uh, running on the um, uh, front end. So that was three years ago. So what's happening today? Well, the truth of it is, uh, today uh, we're seeing the exact same scenario play out with new and different types of uh, types of uh, open source. Um, the number one uh, number one example of this uh, happened this year in May uh, with Solstack, which is another hugely popular to provision servers uh, uh, servers instead of running the servers. Now, Solstack uh, in March found that there was a security vulnerability uh, thanks to the uh, uh, responsible closure of a security company from Finland that uh, helped them uh, help them uh, understand. Uh, in April, uh, they published a new version uh, of their uh, software with uh, fixes to this. And again, once that uh, issue comes out, uh, it took about three days uh, for the exploits uh, to be actively observed in the wild and to be seen uh, happening in the day. In the day. I'm not going to read timeline, but 
you can see that there's plenty of these documented uh, campaigns that can be attributed to this particular vulnerability. So the number one takeaway is it's not just you that's reducing their time to production. It's also the other side uh, that's doing similar things. And this is, a, this is now a phenomenon that we're seeing across the world. The average time to exploitation is probably now hours. The average time to be compromised by these issues is probably days after they, they're being published. So that puts new pressures on us as developers to be able to react because there's a lot of this stuff out there. Now, one of the surveys that we run every year uh, 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 with Sonotype is something we call uh, DevSecOps Community Survey. In that, we ask every year, uh, uh, have you had an open source related uh, security breach? And every year, about uh, 20 to 30 percent of respondents reach, and, and yes, we can attribute it directly to open source. So we can see that this is a fairly large quantity of attacks that are happening uh, towards developers. And you know, kind of a larger, uh, kind of looking at a larger picture. Um, this is a picture and a visualization of all the uh, largest data breaches uh, over the last five years uh, on record count. Now, that's a lot of personally identifiable information that's out there, and I don't think it's a surprise to anyone. But what's pretty really interesting is when you look at just which ones were hacked, actively exploited against. Uh, against uh, each other, we can actually see that um, most of these occur from direct uh, uh, direct campaigns, such as the ones that I've described earlier. So this means that uh, that this is a very real concern that we as developers need to be uh, taking into account uh, actively. Well, why is this happening? Part of the reason for for this is security isn't really a return on it isn't really something that you can justify in terms of return on investment. The return on investment for hiring a security person is that you don't get on one of those lists. You don't get to go to the congressional hearing where your CEO is to answer uh, answer to the legislators about what's happening, uh, and you don't get to be uh, on the newspaper front pages, right? What instead is uh, happening is uh, and what, what's happening because of that is that organizations aren't uh, hiring security to keep up with development, right? Development helps us uh, push stuff out, help us reach new customers, get new features. It's easier to justify. So in most organizations that I work with, um, it's fairly common to see a ratio of about one security person against 100 developers. Uh, you know, some organizations are more mature. It's not uncommon to see 300 developers to one single security person. So that, you know, if you think about it, right, uh, with the increase of speed of production, uh, puts a huge amount of pressure on all the security activities to be occurring uh, uh, occurring in order for stuff to get um, uh, stuff to remain secure, and as a direct correlation of this, we're seeing this sort of uh, increase uh, in this sort of exploitation events. Um, uh, another kind of direct statistic that you can actually see is when we ask developers in this DevSecOps community survey, how quickly can you fix a security? Uh, the most typical answer answer is uh, it takes them uh, between one week and never, right? You know, so most uh, developers say that, you know, they'll fix it either immediately or they'll never get around to it or it takes them, you know, over a year. And almost uh, almost half of the respondents kind of come to this sort of statistic. So it kind of tells us a pretty grim tale that when to our own devices, we're probably prioritizing the value and the good stuff instead of the checking and the uh, let's make sure that the thing is still still running. So, we as developers are getting faster. There's evidence of this uh, elsewhere as well. You know, one of the more interesting statistics to look at, right, is to look at how much open source we're consuming, because open source forms a lot of our software nowadays. In fact, it's probably more than you think. Uh, the first statistic I want to draw your attention to is the download counts from NPMJS, which is the largest ecosystem uh, ecosystem on the internet uh, for open source. They report about 22 and a half billion downloads every single week nowadays. Uh, and if you annualize it and you look at sums up to a year, to, uh, this year uh, we're looking at 1.14 trillion uh, JavaScript packages being downloaded by developers across the world. That's 1.14, 12 zeros at the end, right? That's a really big number, uh, more than your mind can boggle. Uh, if we look at other ecosystems, just uh, uh, such as uh, the main essential, in exactly the same uh, and similar pattern, although the volume is a little bit lower, um, you know, this year we're expecting to see about uh, 376 billion, just shy of 400 billion, just nine zeros uh, downloads of uh, Java uh, from main essential. What's interesting about this is when you look at the graphs, uh, the growth rates of both of those ecosystems 
systems are pretty much logarithmic. So we're seeing, you know, about 40, 50%. And what that has resulted in is that uh, on average, about 80% of the code in a final piece of software is actually not your own code. It's stuff that's been written by someone else. It's either external or it's open source. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because in our first speed, what we're trying to do is not always reinvent the wheel. We're trying to not reinvent cryptography. And nobody I know nowadays when they start a new project started without a, a boilerplate project or a framework or, or something like that. What that results, though, is that the average uh, average NPM project can easily be 300 to 400 dependencies, plus the dependencies of those dependencies as well, because it's not just you using the open source, it's also the suppliers of your own code. And as you can start seeing, that forms a long chain, which is very hard and opaque for us to actually fathom when we're finally trying to put the, the software together. Think about this from an attacker's perspective. I'm an attacker. Uh, I'm looking for the easiest path to get into your organization. And that means I'm not just looking to figure out what your personal logic is, right? Uh, one of the easiest ways for me to get in is to say, okay, does that look like it's running on Struts? Does that look like it's running on Express? What What is the framework that might be behind this. Um, uh, once I figure that out, probably the easiest thing for me to do, figure out all the known attacks, try everything, see which one sticks, right? You know, one of them is bound to stick because there's myriads of them, right? It's much more efficient for me to do that than to try and figure out you specifically, uh, get to know your specific logic and try and figure out what kind of common programming mistakes you might be making in your own code. It's much more efficient for me to look at, you know, the hundreds of open source that you might have there and see if they have any uh, potential security issues. Um, and this type of attack is really the type of attack that we're observing more and more and more. Now, the attack itself is evolving. We're seeing kind of uh, evolutions of this type of attack as well. There's basically two forms of it. There's downstream, which is trying to find your software that runs it. Uh, runs a piece of open source like Apache Struts and attacking that directly. And then there's upstream, which is attacking the open source project themselves in order to introduce some new security vulnerability that only I know about that gets spread far and wide and gets um, uh, gets uh, distributed by to customers. Probably the easiest thing to illustrate this point, right, is to look at these two graphs. The first graph tells you how many, uh, how, what is the combined influence of the 100 most influential maintainers in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Java? We can see that 25 influencers, uh, 25 maintainers and their projects cover about 50% uh, of uh, all of Java uh, open source, right? You know, they reach about 50% of all the developers consuming open source. And a similar situation can be seen in NPM. In fact, the top five packages account for um, uh, 150,000 downloads each, right? So um, it's no wonder that we're starting to see the attack pattern shifting from me as the operator of the software being attacked to the actual piece of code that I'm running uh, being attacked instead, because then it just compromises automatically, you know, tons and tons of tons of software without uh, me even having to figure out where they are. Um, Probably the most alarming stat about this is this year's stats uh, around this. So uh, by July of last year, we had seen 216 instances of this type of attack. When we peel back the clocks and look at this year, uh, that number had grown 430%. In fact, this year we counted almost uh, 1,145 uh, next generation uh, supply chain attacks. So this stuff is going to be increasing. Right? You know, as you're bringing in this sort of third party code, that's probably the easiest attack vector for uh, them to come to. And if you're a maintainer of any project uh, out there, they're probably uh, going to be, you're probably going to be finding uh, very, very helpful strangers that might not always be doing helpful things. So to answer the question of why, this is why. Because it is happening already and it's happening at an increasingly high pace and it's probably, probably going to be speeding up as we see uh, the year go by, because uh, this year, uh, the digital economy has really, because of uh, the pervading circumstances, we're probably going to see much, much more of this stuff being consumed. Now, we do publish a timeline of this, but that's quite a lot of, uh, to, uh, quite a lot to uh, be looking at. So probably the easiest thing to do is to look at uh, what sort of um, uh, attacks are we seeing at, at high, high level. So we see things that uh, still Credentials. So things that you know run on your uh, as you download the package, it steals some credentials from your credential files. We see them stealing passwords. 
Sometimes we see them in store crypto miners, but more increasingly and more recently, we started seeing them acting in more traditional cybersecurity ways as well, thinking like uh, things like uh, introducing backdoors onto your own systems and hijacking your own development tools to poison your own code uh, to uh, vulnerability uh, further. That means that these are acting much more like uh, viruses uh, than they ever have before. And I think uh, this kind of brings into us developers closer to the uh, traditional cybersecurity realm that we've probably ever been before. It's not just our software that's a target, it's also the machine on it, the tooling that we have around it, because those are also very good targets, especially for crypto mining, right? You know, I can just use it uh, to um, use it to generate currency and uh, that's free money for me, right? And nothing away, uh, nothing away uh, at all. So, what can we do? Well, the answer really is DevSecOps uh, is, is what we can do. Um, so, to answer the question of what do DevSecOps uh, organizations actually do, uh, probably one of the more interesting pieces of research from this year's report was this, um, was this uh, research into what do high-performing open source projects do uh, with the regiments, right? Uh, so one of the things that we can do is we can draw some parallels uh, from open source projects to how an organization's uh, software team might run. Uh, we can, for example, say that the release frequency of the open source project is the same as the deployment frequency. We can say that the popularity of the project is the same as the uh, release phase of an organization. We can say that fixing issues is probably the same to restoring from, a, from an incident. So the first thing that we saw is when we look at these open source projects at large, there's about uh, 25,000 of them, we can see that uh, the best projects uh, had both a very, very quick update time. So they were very quick to introduce updates when they came out, you know, typically, uh, typically in the first 100 days. And we saw a very similar uh, uh, time to remediate security vulnerabilities as well. So when a security vulnerability was introduced into the software, they were also quick to align. In fact, these two are very strongly coupled and there's a strong co correlation between the two. So, uh, so one of the more interesting findings is, is probably because we, when we have the tooling and we have the automation of DevOps, that sets us up for being able to just introduce tooling to help us with DevSecOps. The second thing that we did see, though, is that uh, security teams weren't necessarily small teams. One of the biggest objections about introducing DevOps at large and DevSecOps as a, as a side effect is that our teams, you know, our team chooses our own tools, right? And we need to keep the team small because then they can be agile and choose new tools when they need to. Well, it turns out that larger teams are actually quicker to release, you know, on aggregate. And I think this is because uh, when you have larger teams, they have to uh, create a process instead of just working amongst themselves in order to release things. That means formalizing, automating, introducing different types of tooling to automate more and more and more. And that results uh, with them being much faster to upgrade and much, much more frequent with their releases as well. So if we were to take some guidance from these projects, we could see that uh, the, really the focus should be on accelerating uh, and, and maintaining this sort of mean type to upgrade. Uh, committing some specific resources to, for example, managing dependencies uh, instead of letting developers manage it on, on their own, or at least putting someone to be responsible for these dependencies. Uh, it also uh, brings to light the fact that, uh, uh, that um, uh, most organizations that are performing really well release at least four times a year. So if you're going to be starting off with DevSecOps and you're trying to think what my first step is, you probably want to be looking at your release phase as the first phase because that's a very good trade leading indicator of your ability to introduce security checks. Similarly, when we kind of take this at a higher level and we look at other guidance for DevSecOps, we can see that you know, choosing the right open source projects can be very influential to your security regimen. Right? You know, having the right, uh, uh, right guidance on what kind of open source to choose can be a very important metric and we can use these same metrics that we're leveling ourselves against to also measure and say, do they release often? Do they have a big team? You know, what sort of things are happening? That tells you a little bit about their ability to fix the issues upstream when they happen uh, to you uh, as well. So when we kind of all draw this out of map, it can be a lot of different types of activities. But the high performing DevSecOps teams that we see, on average, uh, update their dependencies almost daily, right? They look at their dependency management uh, as a daily activity. They try and use the latest uh, open source. They have some sort of process to help them decide on new things to bring in and new pieces of code to bring in. 
in. And they also have a process for automation to help them remove proactively uh, these unused or problematic uh, dependencies. Uh, what's interesting though is most of them, uh, they're almost 10 times, 12 times more likely to have some sort of uh, automation in order to remove uh, this open source and help them in doing this sort of decision making. Now, that's quite a tall mountain to climb, you know, doing stuff daily uh, that, you know, seemed to be like not a really a big thing. But actually, when we look at the uh, results, we can see that they actually consider updating a lot less painful, almost three, three and a half times less painful than the non-exemplary groups. We can see also that when a security vulnerability does happen and the proverbial hits the fan, so to speak, um, they're much, much more uh, easy, they have a much easier time up upgrading their software and introducing, you know, either new enhancements or new fixes. In fact, there are about two and a half times uh, more less likely to consider this updating uh, of, this, uh, of these dependencies of their code, much less painful. And again, that, that is because uh, introducing a speed to production forces you to think about what the process is, forces you to create automation to enhance on that process. And once you get it to that point, Changing it is much easier than you know communicating against each other and trying to uh, uh, trying to do that. So not only is doing the right thing uh, from a speed and time to market perspective good, it's also good from a security perspective. Now there are tools out there that help you do uh, and automate all of these things. You know there are plugins, for example, for Chrome that help you npm JS as a as a thing. There are IDE plugins that help you as a developer see what your code is at. Uh, and help, help one understand any sort of security vulnerabilities that might uh, affect you. And of course, and these are probably more influential that actually help you uh, help you um, see when you're committing code and you're kind of releasing your upgrades in line of those releases to actually comment and help you change uh, uh, help you change these vulnerabilities away. Automation is important. More important is the practice of, of actively doing this, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have tools, but tools do help. Unfortunately, tools do not equate culture, right? So the culture is much, much more important, which is uh, being able to release things. Finally, of course, you have CI services as well that help you do similar things, and those are kind of what we've been traditionally thinking about as security. But DevSecOps really says that it's not a one-time check. It's a comprehensive suite that happens from the first commit all the way into production, and it's a several set of steps that help you make sure that you make the right choice in the beginning. If something goes wrong in the middle, you still have uh, a learning and a support network to change that uh, away. Finally, uh, we also see that the research suggests that being fast and introducing this sort of automation to cut corners and cut times can be very, very good for you. In fact, when we look at the research published for um, uh, the DevOps Research and, uh, uh, and Assessment Institute, or DORA Institute, we can see that the exemplar, uh, exemplar uh, organizations are almost 300, 200 times more frequently deploying organizations, but they're also almost two and a half times faster to recover from these situations. What's interesting, though, is uh, you would think that introducing these sort of security steps make people more miserable. But actually, uh, it also correlates with happier employees. They're also likelier to be using these third-party co uh, uh, components. So uh, looking at the stats that I showed you earlier, your initial gut reaction might be, let's use less of open source. But actually, when we look at these exemplar organizations, we see that they're more likely to be using these third-party pieces and being even faster. And that's because once they have that automation in place, they're able to just introduce these security checks along the line. The average consumer of Java nowadays consumes almost 300,000 uh, open source components uh, a year, and we can see that uh, about 10% of those have some sort of security vulnerabilities there. So, can we marry this security and uh, speed uh, aspect of it? Of course, and that's what Dev DevSecOps is all about. Um, there are several types of behaviors that we're seeing in order to be able to uh, able to uh, respond to these sorts of issues. But generally speaking, uh, when we look at the wider market and we look at the survey that we ran uh, uh, for all DevSecOps, we split them into four groups. We can see security first groups, uh, security first organizations that prioritize security uh, and have a very, very strict security segment. Uh, on the uh, top right, uh, bottom right, we see companies that prioritize productivity. So who don't have security, but have prioritized this time to speed. 
On the bottom left, we kind of have organizations that have done neither. These are kind of your traditional waterfall type of organizations. And on the top right corner, we have a very high segment of organizations that both they have automation and they're really focusing on time to market and time to release, but they're introducing that sort of security in between. Now, what's pretty interesting is when we look at the transitions between what's, for example, the difference between this high performing organization and a low performer at the bottom. Well, the truth of it is, uh, when we look at what's happening, again, we uh, the top performing organizations are much more frequent to deploy. They are much, much faster to detect vulnerable open source components. And more interestingly, it takes them a lot less time to approve open source for uh, uh, being used. On the top right corner, you usually see organizations taking new pieces of open source in a matter of seconds or, or a matter of minutes. On the bottom left corner, if they do open source checking, it'll to get new open source uh, uh, open source put in. Similarly, when we look at security prioritized organizations that do just security um, and, and don't think about productivity at all, uh, we see that they do have tools and they do have some automation, but they use them as point checks. We use them. Uh, we see them. Uh, uh, see them to be more likely to automate some security steps, but they don't really uh, take care uh, on the productivity side, which can lead you to in this detrimental situations because they think that doing one point check or another uh, uh, is, is is enough, and that leads them to be much slower in uh, their ability to be pushing things out uh, out into the market. So this sort. Of Thing. One of the other thing is, things that you see is that you know these uh, these um, uh, uh, performers actually cluster quite nicely as well. They have kind of overlap with each other, but the respondents that belong to each cluster very very distinctly belong into that cluster. But time and time again, when we look at you know trying to get to that top right corner, we see that organizations that that introduce the security automation into their tooling are uh, better at risk management outcomes. They're better at the developer productivity, and most importantly, the developers are happier, right? Introducing this sort of releasing and the grudge of trying to get things up and the grudge of doing security checks makes them happier developers because they, we can probably focus a lot more on the things that actually matter to us in terms of our software production, which is getting software out into the market. So uh, the guidance for everybody thinking about what can I do in order to do uh, DevSecOps is really simple. Look at this supply chain. You know, look at your open source supply chain. Look at your entire software supply chain and identify the gaps that you see. Right? You know, it might be a productivity related gap. In which case, start with automating uh, your release pipeline. If it is a gap in your security coverage, as in you identify tons of known security vulnerabilities in your code, then it's a good chance that you should probably look at uh, look at securing your open source supply chain. Now, what's uniform with all of these organizations when we see improvement from one segment to another is that they go for the quick wins. They think that's that's easy to implement, you know, the tool that's easy to slot in uh, and automate across the line. Do that first, but finally pursue speed. Right? Speed actually increases everything. Right? Gearing yourself up for speed, practicing for speed, releasing faster. You know, even if it's one more release per quarter, uh, faster every quarter. What we find is that that trains you to be able to react to these sort of situations when security comes and security happens. That's what true DevSecOps is. DevSecOps is not a set of tooling. It's a set of culture that prioritizes both because actually it turns out we have better outcomes. So the summary uh, of this talk really is going faster is a lot better. Going faster is also a lot more secure. Ah, uh, hey, hey, going faster also makes us happier too. So, uh, if there's one takeaway to take, uh, DevSecOps is all about the speed uh, and productivity. Make sure that you're looking at this thing holistically. It's not just about introducing security if your uh, production speed is slow to begin with. It's not just about introducing production speed if you're bogging your speed down by doing excess security. It's about finding a happy balance with both and automating the hell out of everything that you can. So. That's pretty much uh, my talk here uh, today. Thank you very much for watching. If you did get interested in the science behind all of this, a state of the software supply chain uh, report that you can find on our website. Uh, I recommend everybody to uh, take a look at that. Thanks very much for watching. And hey, please uh, don't forget to give me some feedback uh, once you're done with it. Thanks.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elka. I mean, there are lots of bullet points and, and interesting aspects in regards to the Sikshi when, when working with public libraries, uh, independent of the, the application, uh, the program language or the framework. And quite frankly, I find it really, really painful and to, to, to know that I'm using, um, for example, node packages, and then I get the dependency chain. And even so that I might be aware that, okay, this is the top level, I have no idea what is happening three, four, five levels down of the dependencies. And, you know, sometimes it really can cause you sleepless nights, like, okay, are we safe? Are our our website's okay. Uh, and I mean, we are just running this as a community, which does not have, probably not having a financial deficit or financial issue or a data breach issue. So Yeah, I mean, exactly. Exactly. And you know, uh, that's actually one of the reasons why we're seeing these upstream uh, attacks occurring, because uh, because, uh, you know, it's the, it's the typical JavaScript story, isn't it? It's the, uh, the protocol developer that c comes up with a, a library that has a couple of million downloads a week, right? You know, he's, they're doing it independently, they're doing it on their own and trying to kind of keep the thing maintained. So when someone then comes in and says, hey, I can help you, that can kind of be a blessing, right? But it can also be a problem if these other sorts of situations happen. So really, it's the complexity that makes it very hard for us to even think about it, right? It's kind of almost too big to keep in your head as a developer, but uh, it's a very real issue. And luckily, you know, we can automate it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a welcoming addition. And I mean, I really like the fact that when you when you run your updates on your, on your node packages, for example, that you, you can run the audit, you can eventually fix yes. it a little bit uh, on GitHub now since about la end of last year, you get feedback if you are activating, I think, the, the Dependa bot, so that does an analysis yes. of, your, of your repositories. I mean, there is already movement in general towards uh, the situation to improve um, the security, the stability, the the the, 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 liability, the reliability of, of packages in general, but I mean, Having a product like like what you were talking about um, is is absolutely interesting for for companies to put it into their own pipelines in order to to have peace of mind and I think the confidence and the happiness of the developer. I mean, this would be a really major plus point in my case. Yeah. Uh -huh. Great to hear, and, and you know that's exactly it. It's about it's not about uh, one single check either, right? You know, if I check it today, it might be bad tomorrow. So it's all really also about comprehensive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the kind of key things about the value stream analogy is to really think about what does it take from keyboard into production? What are those steps? What are those automation pieces and deployment uh, timelines that we're having? Because that mm -hmm. usually helps us get us to get us to the end and introduce these checks along the way. All right. Adija, what's your experience in regards to what you just saw? I don't have a, uh, so much experience in security, but I do know that Python packages tend to go obsolete really quick. Now, if there's like ops can automate this, it's really cool. Mm. Um, Ilka, just tell me a little bit about um, Sonatype. What are the platforms that there's integration possible? What are the package observations, what are the programming languages that we are looking at? Yeah, <clears throat> fantastic, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad to tell you actually. So, Sontype are really actually, the, we are the original founders of Maven Central. So to this day, we actually operate uh, that registry uh, for the community. So like I said, you know, we're seeing tons and tons of open source being adopted. From a commercial side, uh, we're probably most known for our Nexus platform. So if you've ever used something called Nexus repository, that's actually also us. Um, so really, as an organization, we focus with, in managing that open source. Uh, uh, from a security perspective, our tooling, uh, uh, the parts of our platform uh, around that uh, particular topic are tools like Nexus Lifecycle and Nexus Firewall, which kind of help you introduce these checks 
across the line. You know, we have in a group of about 60 different integrations to various different types of development tooling, things like Visual Studio Code and GitHub and GitLab and uh, Jenkins and Azure DevOps and, you know, you name it, we probably have a plugin for it to run this open source analysis. Today, mm -hmm. we cover about 15 different programming languages from the security, licensing, but also, uh, interestingly, we've started looking at the quality of these open source projects, right? Are they big projects? Are they yep. releasing suspicious Vicious releases or not. And we're helping our customers kind of not only fix the issues once uh, we discover the open source, but also to make better choices about their open, cho open source before they put it in. Because as it turns out, the fastest way of uh, dealing with the security vulnerability is not to have it in the first place, right? You know, mm -hmm. if you can make the right choice in the beginning, then that helps you a lot with the pain uh, further down the line. Okay. Um, as we are a community, we have our, uh, we have our public report repositories on GitHub. Uh, we are into open source. We are largely non-profit. Do you have any packages like for students, like for communities, where it is a possibility to, to actually use some benefits um, of, of, your, of your products or services that you're offering? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, go to a website called, uh, called the OSS index. Uh, the OSS index is, is the free offering that we provide to uh, all the open source communities uh, to help you get started with this. So what's pretty cool about the OSS index is we have developer tools, for example, uh, for NPM, we've got a package called AuditJS that allows you to actually put it in as a dependency in your, uh, in your package JSON and check your builds as you're building them. So kind of enhancing uh, uh, NPM audits. We also have tooling for, uh, tooling for other programming languages uh, available, about 15 different programming languages again, and the vulnerability database is free for everybody to look at. So even if you just get a security issue highlighted, you can get some of the benefits. Once you uh, kind of get started, it's a great uh, set of tooling to get started. You can also just mm -hmm. use the same tools with our enterprise software. So if you ever do want to pay some money, uh, very easy, easy to do and almost little to change. Finally, uh, if you just need to do a begin somewhere, may I suggest starting with Nexus Repository OSS, which is our warehousing solution. You know, so in that in that supply chain analogy, that helps you at least understand exactly what open source is coming in. Again, mm -hmm. that's completely free and open source and supports everything that uh, we support in general. That sounds awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely going to have a look and uh, even considering about putting it into our MSCC repositories so that at least we get some other members here in the community get a chance to actually um, have a look into that when you when they clone or when they pull the repositories. I think this might be a really good learning experience. And yeah, I hope that also then a few companies here in Mauritius might pick it up and see into your professional solutions. Hey. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and a fantastic talk. Great having you here well, around. And also, I think you are you are in 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 uh, in uh, collaboration with Ninth Bit, with, which is also one of our partners for the conference. So, would be great maybe in the future to welcome you in Mauritius. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. I, I look forward to it too. Thanks very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Thank you so Thank much. You, Have a great day. Bye. Bye.